questions and made everybody in the state a little bit wacky, nervous, concerned, depressed. Where's our future? Where are things going? And also, since the beginning of time, people my age have been telling people your age that we have all the answers. Listen to us. And right now, we don't have all the answers. The shift in this economy has just shaken us to our very core. It's different, it's big, but I think it's an opportunity. So I want you to take some time here to rethink a lot of the things you've heard. We're gonna, we're gonna debunk a couple of myths. We're gonna talk about some opportunities, and we're gonna talk about an economy that is really your economy for us. Now, I was born a long, long time ago behind this ugly plant. This is the old Fort Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan. And this was the plant that created the standard for manufacturing in the Industrial Revolution. This was a plant where the raw materials came in at one end and cars came out the other end. 100,000 people worked at this plant on three shifts. They included my grandfather, my father, and my uncles. And this plant, over the course of its development, from the 20s to the 40s, was the standard for the world. People came from all over the world to see how you could create a manufacturing facility. The raw materials came in one end and the finished product came out the other. And at the height of their development and their productivity, World War II broke out. And overnight, a plant that was producing consumer goods, cars, had to become the arsenal of democracy. And that plant shifted its production, and almost overnight, the jobs that were held by my grandfather, my father, and my uncles were then held by my mother and my aunts. And they produced the tanks and the artillery for World War II. That manufacturing model was what created the 20th century economy in Michigan. My family, me, we represent the 20th century. You're the 21st century. I come from a family of miners, coal miners, factory workers, and barbers. My father has a seventh grade education. My mother is the only one in her family of nine to graduate from high school and I'm the first female to graduate from college. Again, pretty much a 20th century story. Now sometimes economic disaster hits a community, sometimes it hits a state. Back in my day, it just hit my house, or it felt like it did. Because when I was about your age, the good news for me is that the Beatles came out. The bad news, my father was borrowed. Nobody got the haircut for a long, long time. They just cut off the electricity in our house. So to this day, my father's idea that I had on the roof was due to rock and roll. So, we're still left with all these questions. What happened to that Michigan economy? Is it gonna get any better? Where are the jobs? How do we get these new jobs? What's going on and what is our future goal? So let's talk about that. First of all, what happened? What happened was the 20th century was the era of manufacturing. It, it, it fueled big companies, small companies, networks of suppliers, and all that good stuff. Over probably what I think is a 10 to 15 year period, the world became free, global, and digital. And it changed everything. It changed everything as to how we find power, produce power, move power, share power. In terms of being global, all of a sudden other countries are competing for the same customers that we are, and the world became digital. We don't, no industry has been unchanged by what the digital revolution has done. We don't buy the same, we don't read the same, we don't get newspapers the same, we don't sell the same, manufacture, farm, nothing. It's all a different way of producing goods and services, and it's taken everybody by surprise. You're beginning to be part of what I think is one of the few major times in world history when the change is so big, it's so huge, that you will be 
recognized by future generations as the generation that implemented one of the big, big challenges in the economy. Many, many, many hundreds of years ago, one of those changes was when Gutenberg invented the printing press. All of a sudden, people could share information, they could learn, they could create. Huge, a real pivotal change in an economy. The second time was the Industrial Revolution. 1800s to, I think, it stopped about 1990. I think that ended the Industrial Revolution. And the way people produced goods changed forever. It, it enhanced the ability for people to buy and share and trade in a whole new, whole new way. Your part of the next revolution is digital. People my age, we can adopt technology, we can adapt to technology. You were born with technology. This will be a part of who you are and how you view the world. You're going to be the best educated generation our country has ever seen. You will be the most technologically competent. Your generation, you will cure cancer, you will cure Alzheimer's, and you will figure out a way to feed 7 billion people. And you will do that because you're the most trained, the most educated, you're going to use technology, and you're not going to be burdened with old thinking, old skills, old whining that people my age tend to do. We're boo-hooing over an economy that served us well, but it is now morphing into something else. And you're going to be the leaders of that. So I say to Michigan, it's time, it's time to stop whining and looking backwards. Okay, so if people around here are whining and moaning and lamenting what used to be. Respect them, say thank you very much, but I'm the future, and that's what I want to focus on. So let's talk about a couple of myths about Michigan that, first of all, we need to just get rid of. First, the myth that all young people leave Michigan. A couple things. Forbes magazine, big, big business magazine, lists the top 10 states where young college graduates leave. We're not in the top 10. I also spoke with the state demographer. All this guy does is count the people who move in and move out of Michigan. Last year, 2011, people the age of 25 to 34 leaving Michigan, our state ranked 38 out of 50 states of young people leaving their home states. What people need to recognize is your generation is a very mobile generation. It's very likely that any one of you might go somewhere and come back, but they're doing that all throughout the United States. Now let's talk about the weather. People lament about Michigan's weather. Actually, that's Chicago, by the way. So if we have bad winters, they have horrible winters. But let's talk a bit. At the end of the day, we're at the four season state. There are probably only a dozen true four season states in this country. We're one of them. But here's what we don't have. We don't have traumatic weather events that cause economic and personal disruption. These all reflect billion dollar weather events. Earthquakes, firestorms, droughts, and all the other horrific things that happen. Michigan is at the very, very lowest end of this scale. We have four Beautiful seasons. I'm not saying come March, I might not want to take a break. But at the end of the day, we want 12 states with four seasons. It gives us more sporting opportunities, more things to do, and we don't have traumatic weather. So, if the world has gone green, global, and digital, where does Michigan fit in all this? And I truly believe, and I've done a lot of research on this, and I'm doing more research, and that is. But I think Michigan's going to be one of maybe 15 states that can truly be 21st century states. <clears throat> and before I go into that, here's one other thing I'm working on, and maybe you can do your own research. But it occurred to me, in some of the research, 50% of the states in this country have absolutely no professional sports teams. So half the states have no professional sports teams. A fewer number of those have four professional sports teams, as we do. And of the four professional sports teams this year, three out of four 
went to postseason play. In addition, four of our top universities, Michigan, Michigan State, Western, and Wade State, all went to bowl games and championship seasons. And we held the Super Bowl twice, and the NCAA Final Four. I dare you to find another state with those statistics. All right, now, so let's move on. Just start for a minute. Check me on this. I might be wrong, but I think I'm right. So, how does Michigan fit into an economy that's green global energy? Green, we've got 20 million acres of forest and farmland where we can grow and be green and be great air exchange and become a, and have this exploration and peace and quiet and all the things and we can grow the economy. Number two, we are global. And third, we're digital, where a state is embracing change in all three of these areas. Green, the forest, the farmland, we're very, very proactive in alternative energy, particularly up in the thumb. I drive up from Detroit and I pass a whole lot of sticky petroleum plants. And I see the wind turbines, and to me, they're, they're a work of art. And I've done a little YouTube clip that I'm sending to everybody I know so they can see how beautiful they are. But at the end of the day, we're also a high concentration of fresh water. We live in an area that has the highest concentration of fresh water on the entire planet. This is a map of the world. There are just a few areas that have fresh water. And here's where you live, kids, right here. That's an amazing natural resource. It will make oil and gas look like nothing in the future. This is a big deal. As we go forward, what does it mean to be part of the digital, the, uh, excuse me, the global state? For us to enhance our economy, both for Michigan and for the nation, we need to send our products and goods out to other countries. We can do that in Michigan. Did you know if you're eating black beans in London, England, or Mexico City, they're from Michigan? We have the airports, the waterways, we have several international borders. There are very, very few states that can lay claim to that. So we've got the potential of anything we produce of getting it out to the world market. Still, there are questions. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for my career? What does that mean for our future? And I'm only gonna to touch on a couple different economies. But I'm telling you, if you live in a state that will be one of 15 that are truly ready to be 21st century states. First, let's talk about agriculture. Michigan, it has the second most diverse agricultural economy, second only to California. We grow and produce more items, diverse agricultural items, only second to California. Secondly, in the past 10 to 12 years, the way people think about food, they want to know where it's grown, where it's from, where they purchase it, how it affects their health. The relationship of people to food and where it's from has changed forever. That can do nothing but enhance the agricultural economy of Michigan. I go to Eastern Market, which is an open air market in Detroit every Saturday, and at its peak in the summer, 50,000 people come to that market every Saturday. <laughs> and they jump over each other to get to Michigan farmers. Detroit considers Michigan farmers to be rock stars, absolute rock stars. That's a new and different energy that was not around 10 years ago. Let's talk about tourism. Again, four season state. I have family from Arizona who say, you know what, we're coming back for four months in the summer because we miss the green, we miss the water, we even miss the rain. We have the top rated social media site in the country for tourism. In addition, Time Magazine listed Grand Rapids as a dying city. Young people said, I don't think so, and they created a lift up that has had five million hits. It's the Grand Rapids lift up, and it's worth checking out. In addition, Good Morning America asked everyone across the United States to name the most beautiful spot in America. And they identified the Sleeping Bear Dunes. 
So again, with four seasons, and all the natural beauty our state has, tourism is, is an ongoing, wonderful opportunity. Next, manufacturing. They predict 30,000 additional manufacturing jobs in our state by 2015. But these will not be the manufacturing jobs of my uncle and my grandfather and my father. Manufacturing jobs now require experience, skill, and education. Very sophisticated equipment. I don't know if any of you have an opportunity to go out of the auto show this year, but the amount of technology in autos and trucks right now is beyond what anyone could have anticipated 10 years ago. So this old Ford Rouge plant is now this Ford Rouge plant, and it is green, it is global, it is digital. The roof on a great part of this facility is in fact sedum growing lime on the top of that roof. And so as you go forward, you have a few questions of how do we pull all this together? First of all, view your career in your life as having to keep sort of a career toolbox. And while that might sound like a little bit of a dorky term, the concept is from this point forward, you will be putting things into this toolbox that will help you gain additional jobs, opportunities, and education. The first thing you're going to put in the toolbox is your high school diploma. And then you'll have to recognize that you live in a generation that will be lifelong learners. Because of the digital world, you will be learning and changing, and things that right now you take for granted will be old school in four or five years. But you will be lifelong learners. You will need to be technologically confident and competent in some way, because any career you choose will incorporate some degree of technology. You don't need to fear the future because you need to be the future. Your generation will change the future of this state and this country. And you want to be an asset, not a liability, to your employer, to your community, and to your family. So as we go forward, and you hear people lamenting and whining about our state and what used to be, I want you to stand up and tell the Michigan, hey, it's time to stop feeling inferior and start thinking 